We welcome everybody again to our study of the Godhead. And I don't know whether you remember, but uh, we had reached the stage in the class last week as we studied the topic of the omnipotence of God that uh, I was going to ask a couple of questions. And uh, I will, before I get into that, to finish out that part of our study, remind you again, just by way of review, that when we speak of the one God, then we're speaking of the one divine essence. It's what God is. And from his essence comes his nature, and his nature is displayed to us through his divine attributes. And these things cause us to realize that he is not a man, and we cannot or should not think of him as a man. But because we are human beings, as he created us to be, put us where we are, governed by time and space, then we must understand we cannot fathom God. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, that the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed unto us and our children forever. And we mention again that we can know God in a general way from nature, from what he's created. But we cannot learn the will of God for us, that is, how we live on this earth to be pleasing to him, except by revelation, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So when he gave us his will, he gave it to fit the way he created us to come to any understanding of anything. He didn't bypass the way that humans come to understand anything. Thus, he revealed himself in words. His will is revealed in words. What are words? They are vehicles of thought. They are signs of idea. If uh, you want to understand me tonight, you must be speaking English, or you must have somebody that can translate English into whatever mother tongue you have. Because signs of ideas are different in different languages. But notice they're signs of ideas. What travels from my mind to your mind and vice versa must do so through a vehicle of thought. And that's a word. These words can be orally spoken or they can be written. And thus language plays a very important part in our understanding God's will for our lives. Now, we're looking at the matter of God's omnipotence, that he is all power, powerful. And the questions I wanted to raise come from um, Isaiah 14 and verse uh, 27. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out. And who will turn it back? Now, that means that God has all power. There's no more power outside that's above and beyond the power God has. He has all power. So God's omnipotence assures that his purpose will not be indulged, will not be hindered. It will not be turned back or he will not be turned back, either way you want to say it, from his will being accomplished, being brought to fruition. The intent of his will will always be the same. Omnipotence gives actuality to God's will. That simply means he causes it to come to pass because he is all power. It's impossible for God to think what will be and it not happen. What God wills, he is able to do. Notice Psalm 115 and verse 3. Our God's in heaven. And we can say it this way, he does whatever he pleases. 
Now, even when we read the revealed mind of God in those words concerning himself and his omnipotence, we must keep in mind he does whatever he pleases as it fits the essence of his being. I remember God cannot lie because the essence of his being is truth. And how does truth form a lie? Jesus pointed out the one that lies and was a murderer from the beginning was the devil. And what's interesting, he's a supernatural, powerful being. And he goes about this earth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yet we can, by trusting in God's word, resist him. And he'll flee from him. Now, omnipotence doesn't imply the absolute how can I say it? I guess say it, the absolute power to do anything or to do everything. Now, we touched on this last week, I think. God never wills to do what is wrong. God then cannot lie, as I said, number 23, 19, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Now, let me ask this question. Concerning lying, would the ability to lie make God more powerful? That's really a silly question. It certainly wouldn't. And of course, he can't because of what I said a moment ago. God cannot commit adultery. And I'd ask again, would the ability to commit adultery make God more powerful? Well, of course, adultery and fornication belong to the human sphere has nothing to do with God. God cannot cut it. And again, would the ability to cut it make God more powerful? Well, the answer, of course, is no to these questions. Lying, immorality, and covetousness are all sins. They transgress the will of God. Man being a free moral agent, he made us that way, put us where we have the power to choose and suffer the blessings of the consequences of our choices. Um, those sins do not make one stronger but weaker. So let's keep in mind, we'll probably repeat this more as I've already said it, God cannot act contrary to his nature. As I pointed out last week, as Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. He cannot deny himself. Now, let's keep that in mind as we come closer to the end of the topics of his omnipotence as one of his attributes. I'm trying to figure the way to say this. I, Yes, this is as good a way as any. Behind the seemingly triumph of sin in the world is the omnipotent God who will ultimately and finally exercise his power by judging sin. And this is where a man who denies the existence of God and thinks of everything only from the standpoint of time, space, material things, and how men function in that condition. Want to fuss about God not destroying all evil now. But they don't know God. They don't stop to think that God is not impacted in any form or fashion by the creation that he made. And thus, when we talk about why does God do this now, God is not governed by saying you know, the world's ever however many years old it is and however many years he will allow it, if he does allow years for it to go into the future and there's no past or future with God. 
but he has a design and purpose for creating time and space and material things and creating us and putting us here in a body that is governed by these things. And I firmly am convinced after the study of the scriptures that when all is said and done, God wanted to populate heaven with creatures, his creatures, made a little lower than the angels, who would want to go to heaven though they'd never been there. And you see, angels are created in heaven before his very throne. And they never were material beings. They're strictly spiritual beings created to accomplish what God wants them to do in heaven. Sometimes they carried messages and did things here on earth, such as the angels that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and cities of the plains, or as they brought messages, um, a message to Joseph and to Mary concerning the birth of Christ and so on. So God, as I said last week, works in the very time he created and the very space he created, but he's not governed by any of them. They don't impact him. So we, in this time period, by the word of God, manifest his will for us while we're here, is cultivating us. Because we've never seen heaven, never experienced heaven. Don't know what it's like to live in such a place as far as experiential living. That is, actually experiencing it in actuality. But yet we will get to heaven because we want to go to heaven. And we're willing to submit to God on this earth, no matter what it costs us, in order to get to heaven. That even gives more meaning to well done, thou good and faithful serving. So if God's all-powerful, then there cannot be another who is all-powerful. For two cannot possess all power, only one. It's interesting to note, as I remind you again from Matthew 28, 28 18, that Jesus said all power, American Standard says all authority, hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Well, the Father relinquished that power as the first person of the Godhead by giving that power to his son. Now, we've already talked about for a while, Jesus became a man as much as you are, I am a human being. And he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus, when he died on the cross, he didn't die for any wicked thing he had done. He died on our behalf. And thus, through an obedient faith to his gospel, which remember, there's where God located his power to save men from sin, Romans 1, verse 16. Then he can get us on the road, as it were, to growing up in Christ and preparing ourselves for the heaven he wants us all to have. So there's only one that has all power. There cannot be, to put it another way, two superlatives. Thus, dualism, which asserts the equal power and existence of two opposing realities, good and evil, cannot be accepted. Now, that comes from the idea that Satan was an eternal being as well as God. Satan's evil and uh, God's not. Well, they can't both have all power. And evil is less powerful than good. We overcome evil with good. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So Satan's not on the same plane with God. He's a spiritual being that in eternity chose to reject God, to oppose him and rebel against him. Evil 
And of course, evil men are not going to be victorious. Now, there may be times in this life when it appears they are, but they're not. Remember, God's will is going to be done. Satan thought he had won when he killed the Christ. He hadn't. And so, so Christ um, rose victorious on the third day over death. Paul points out clearly that the sting of death is sin. But God's made it possible by his power to work all things according to his very nature. Has made uh, it possible for us to gain forgiveness of sins. Be justified in his sight, reconciled to him. And to have fellowship with him. So the sting of death is removed. And they say, well, I thought we still had to die if he doesn't come back first. Yes. But we don't stop at death in our thinking. The Bible's full of material, especially the New Testament, says, think about the resurrection. So we'll be resurrected from the dead. And he does that by his power. So God is able to subject all things to himself. And in the very consummation of his will. The believer who I guess you could say feels weak and frail. That feeling you just start in his mind, not thinking like it ought to. Exposed to and at the mercy of sinful men. You find security and assurance and a sense of protection in his knowledge of God's good word. And that teaches us that God's able to keep him safe if he so chooses. And he can. Old Testament's full of material that shows that God can protect anybody. I think of the three Hebrew children cast into the fire. And there's comment before they were cast in to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we're not going to bow down to this idol and violate the law of Moses sin against God. God can deliver us from this if he desires. But whether he does or he does not, we're going to stay true to his word in our lives. Of course, what happened? They were delivered from the fire furnace. So our well-being is not in our hands, but it's in his omnipotent hand. If we have to judge ourselves from the standpoint of getting along in a good way, all those things that worry most people, then we're forgetting that as children of God, his omnipotence is on our side. Our security is in him. So we're to rest in him. We're to uh, trust him, knowing that we're very fragile creatures. We have a fragile existence. And God will maintain it according to his purpose for us. That's done because he is omnipotent. Does God have a purpose for each one of us as his child. Of course he does. Do I know exactly what all of it is? Well, ultimately, to be in heaven with him. He did all the things he's done that we read about in the Bible to make it possible for sinful man to be forgiven, stand before God as if he had never sinned because the blood of Christ cleaves us cleansed from our sins, verse John 1, 7, and be in heaven with him. Jeremiah 32 in verse 17 will end our study this time of omnipotence. Ah, Lord, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Jeremiah 32 in verse 17. So that's important. 
that we recognize that in our daily living as to erasing a great many things that bother us and will bother all those who apostatize, but especially those who never know the Christ. They may appear to be the happiest folks in the world, but they're not, not at all. Now, let me see as far as studying the attributes are concerned. We're taught in the Bible to be holy even as God is holy. So it seems to me that we need to have a good understanding of holiness. And I think uh, last week I sent everybody uh, through Sonia's mail out on, on email uh, a, a list of scriptures concerning the holiness of God. God is holy. What does that mean? Well, he's untainted by sin. He is above, beyond, and separate completely from sin. God is absolute purity. And that harkens maybe back to Eric's sermon this past Sunday when he talked about the beatitude of blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. To be holy is to be pure. And with the expression, God is light, 1 John 1, verse 5. John is affirming the holiness of God. Now, in both Testaments, you'll notice the testimony, it's all one. It's all united that God is holy. In Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 and 1 Peter 1, 16. And that he is thrice, three times holy. Or we could say it this way, regarding the one eternal divine essence. He is the thrice holy God. Isaiah 6, verse 3 and Revelation 4, 8. You ever wondered why at times, as such passages are read, that says, holy, holy, holy. We sing a song sometimes. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Well, that song comes from an understanding, at least to a certain extent, of the one God in three persons, or three persons in one God. God is said to be glorious in holiness, Exodus 15, verse 11. I think I gave you that one. Thus, imperfection is inconsistent with the one divine essence or God. And why is that? Simple, or perfection is what God is. We're studying as we study the one divine essence, what God is. If God were not perfect, then he wouldn't be God. So holiness and God must be defined as conformity to his own perfect nature. Remember that uh, Samuel's mother, Hannah, Hannah prayed, no one is holy like the Lord, 1 Samuel 2, 2. So God is not holy because he wills to be holy. Rather, holiness, the holiness of God, the holiness of the one divine eternal essence is actually his essence, what he is. Remember, we've said several times when we study the one divine essence, we're studying what God is. So with God, holiness is not arbitrary. That is, it's not dependent upon his will to be holy. Meaning holiness is not optional with God. God is holy, holy, holy. I said 6 3, Revelation 4 8. I said, He cannot see. God's holiness has been viewed in three ways. 
One of them is that some consider his holiness to be simply one of his attributes, equal to and alongside the other attributes. Number two, his holiness has been viewed as the main attribute. I think it was uh, Strong who called it the fundamental attribute, the one which governs all the other attributes. For instance, his love is a holy love and his omnipresence is a holy presence. And the third view is that his holiness is interpreted as the sum of all his attributes. Holy is a word that refers to all that God is and speaks of a full summation of God's perfection. Well, two essential concepts we want to look at here. Because these ideas or concepts are inherent in God's holiness, uniqueness, and perfection. Uniqueness and perfection. Holy in the Old Testament is the translation of the Hebrew word wadash, and it means to cut or to separate. With the same idea in the New Testament words, hagiazo and hagias. The word holy speaks of the position someone or something standing apart or separate from other people or things. In connection with the Hebrew religious life, there were holy vessels, remember? They were holy garments and they were holy days. What does that mean? Well, these were separate or set apart from other vessels and other garments and other days. They occupied a special position, separate from all others. When used of God, holy speaks of his distinctness. We can say his uniqueness, his separateness. The fact that God is set apart from all creation, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, God is absolutely distinct from all his creatures, being high and lifted up. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. And I think that to be a significant thing. And always in the Old Testament and in the New, but it's really laid out plainly in the Old Testament, that God will not tolerate people taking holy things and using them just like everything else. They were meant to be used for a certain thing, and he designated they be used for that thing, and thus they're holy. And I would say this ties in to sanctify, which means to set apart. Thus Christians in the church are sanctified, thus we are saints. Because we're holy, even as he is holy by the very process of God in the gospel system that makes us holy. Now, you think of God, we've already emphasized in other times and places in this study that God is transcendent. And the majestic transcendence of God confronts man. How, how can I say it? With his. Uh, it is being a creature with his creatureliness. I guess that's a word. Before the holy God, man feels inept and undone. Before the holy God, man cannot stand. To even begin to sense his gloriousness is then to become aware that the Lord is as I said earlier, high and lifted up. So the only acceptable response before such uniqueness is self-abasement, total humiliation, absolute submission before the Almighty. God is God, and beside him there is no other. 
from the believer, this holiness evokes praise and worship. The psalmist admonished God's people of that day, give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name, Psalm 30, verse 4. And also in Psalm 105, verse 3, glory in his holy name. And referring to the nations, the psalmist declares, let them praise your great and holy name, awesome name. He is holy, 99. Psalm 99 and verse 3. And another, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. In 99 and verse 5, Psalm 99 verse 5. Man's place is at his footstool. And when approaching God, man must remove his shoes, as it were. Exodus 3 and verse 5. Now, you know, that is the command God gave to Moses as he approached the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. There's always been a way for a man to show his obeisance to God, to show that he's not worthy, and to worship God. Now, today, we don't have the command to literally and actually remove our shoes off our feet to worship him. That was a time where there was a system of shadows and types. But the holiness of God makes us inwardly untried and humble. And thus we worship him. And that gives even more meaning to the Lord's teaching to the Samaritan woman in John 4 that God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Helps me to understand more what he meant by in spirit. God's holiness involves the moral and the ethical. Uh, which all, which both indicate his moral excellence, his ethical perfection, all that's involved in him. He is separate or apart from sin. I back up one thirteen, Job thirty four ten, Psalm twenty five verse eight, and in reaction to sin, God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, and as we studied not long ago on Wednesday night, Hebrews 12, and verse 29. So God cannot be uh, guilty of evil acts or evil attitude. His desires are holy. His will is holy. His ways are holy. His revelation is holy. He is morally upright in character and conduct. Notice again, his revelation is holy. What does that tell us about how we view the Bible and how we study it and that we don't take it lightly like we would a human-produced book? What's well, communication of God to mankind? All of it for the good of man. Maybe we never think about this, but what in the world would we do without the Bible? Well, a lot of people nowadays are trying to do without it. That's the reason when the mess we're in, the further we get away from it, study of it, to believe it's God's word to direct our lives on earth, be well pleasing to him, the worse it's going to get. God is not, uh, is not only not uh, guilty of sin, it's impossible for him to come guilty of sin because God cannot see him. So sin is not a potential within 
the essence of God or within what God is. Sin is not only inconsistent with the deity, it is an impossibility of deity. Sin would mean that God would no longer be God. So holiness is the immutable state of God's existence. When we say immutable, it's unchanging. Man can contemplate perfection. Here again, we're going back to accepting the fact of a thing. But we cannot comprehend perfection. All that we know is imperfect. The creation around man is flawed. And man himself is a flawed person. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Perfection is a revelation to us about God. It's not an understanding by us of God who has revealed himself to us as a light in whom is no darkness at all. We cannot understand perfection. We stand amazed at it. We, we're, we wonder at it. And thus we worship. We worship according to what God's told us to do in this Christian age in the New Testament. There are two manifestation, manifestations that I think are quite engaging concerning God's holiness. And that is the law and Jesus. The law and Jesus. In the revealed law of God, man has a basis, foundation for human morals. For the law of God is a reflection of God's ethical perfection. Instructing man in what is acceptable conduct and what and in what um, is prohibited conduct or action. From the law, man knows what he is to do and what he's not to do. Since the law is only a reflection of the essential purity that we've already noted is of God, and the purity he requires of his creation, it's quite obvious then the ultimate basis for right and wrong is the character or nature of God himself. God is law. That coincides, parallels the fact that God is justice. God is a just God. You can't have one without the other. Even when you have the New Testament, which is a system of faith that involves law, it's not a pure system of law such as the law of Moses. Uh, there's an interesting statement that I think a lot of people overlook found in the book of Romans just before we go into the sixth chapter of Romans. We've already looked at it in our Wednesday night Bible class. Ken is teaching. The very last verse, remembering there were no chapters or verses in the New Testament. Here's a letter written by Paul to the Romans. And he says plainly in verse 21, the last verse of the chapter, chapter 5, chapter 5, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, look at that closely, please. Sin is the transgression of the law. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ, Romans 6.23. 
But sin reign. Well, a reign involves a law. It involves power. And notice it says that sin reign unto death. You think of a king reigning. How can he reign except through law? All right. Sin hath reign unto death. Look at the word unto, not into. It means toward a given end. You sin, that's that brings about or causes one to be cut off from God, to be separated from God. He says, as that were, then notice, even so. My grace, there's God's favor we don't deserve. Grace as it pertains to our being forgiven of our sin. So grace reigns too. See, he says grace reigns through, there's the avenue. Grace reigns through an avenue. You have water coming to your house in most cases. It gets avenue, usually if it's from the well or from wherever you get your water. It rains or runs. We could do that and let run take the place of rain here. It runs through pipes to get it to where you can use it for whatever you use water for. So grace reigns through righteousness. Well, what is that? Remember how many times we said this at other times. My tongue shall speak thy word, David said, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 172. Well, grace, the grace, the favor of God that we don't deserve, we cannot merit. It rules, but how does it rule? It rules through certain commandments of God. Notice the unto, in order to eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord, to a given end. Unto is to a given end. It's not into, it's unto. To a given end. And what is that end that grace rules and reigns? Eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Thus you have in James 1 verse 25, whoso looketh into the perfect, what do we say about God being perfect? Perfect law of liberty. We're at liberty from the law of Moses. It was, as we've been studying on Wednesday night, that which makes one very cognizant of when he sinned. It was never meant to accomplish what the gospel system, the New Testament system, does. It was meant to cause men to be exceedingly, or to feel, I guess you could say, exceedingly sinful. That may be hard to define, but it just means you're keenly aware of it because the law was written and given to you that you shouldn't do this or you should do that, and you're keenly aware when you violate it. More about that, and Ken's been dealing with that on Wednesday night. So, right is not determined by consensus or decree, but by the thrice holy God. It must be emphasized. I can't emphasize it too much. That holiness is not what God wills, but what God is. When you deal with atheists and, and they try to deal with God and how we pointed out there that there cannot be a moral code. There cannot be a code of ethics without God. They will say, well, we believe certain things are right or wrong, ethically. Well, that's not to say one and not to say the other. Of course, atheists really do not live up to the complete implication of their atheism. But that's the, 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 the effort for them to try to say, well, good is here because God wills it. No, good is here because the essence of God is good. And all these laws for man's conduct here in the area of morality simply flows out from God. 
So God doesn't say, well, I think I'll decide today to say it's wrong to commit adultery. No, that's not what we mean by it being wrong because God said so. When God says something, it flows out of the very essence of his being. God is love. God is power. And so on and so forth. So an act or an attitude is not holy because God determines that the act or attitude will be holy for man. But here's why. Because the act or attitude is consistent, consistent with what or who God is, his divine essence. It says uh, another way, right and wrong are determined by God's essence, not by his will. And that says it better than the other way. Right and wrong are determined by what God is, by his essence, not by him willing it to be. So God is law. But it must be observed. I cannot emphasize some of these things too much and urge you to go back and study them more. That in the most profound sense, God's will is part of his essence. Not something that is external to his essence. His will flows from his essence, from what deity is. The will is part of God. The essence is all that God is. I guess we're getting about the time that we want to take some questions, if that's 